And that's the most important thing you need to know. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this interval notation. For those watching this video that weren't in class, that was just a joke to relax you. Don't worry about that. Let's talk more about this interval notation. When we're doing interval notation with domain, what we're doing is the domain is the part or parts of the number line. that we are allowed to plug into the function. So at the very end of class last time, I do realize it was kind of rushed last time, we were talking about how to do domains and interval notation, and we were talking a little bit about how we couldn't divide by zero and how we couldn't take the square root of a negative. Does that sound familiar to everyone? That's where we left off? Okay, so I just kind of want to Come back and hit that again. So when we're looking at the number line like this, this number line has every single x value on it that you could possibly use. So it has all the positives, all the negatives, all the fractions, all the decimals. It has 0. It has all the numbers we might possibly try to plug into an equation. So when you're asking for the domain, you're asking where are the numbers on this number line that has every single real number on it that we're allowed to plug in. And with many, many functions, we let people know that they can plug in any single number they want. And the way we let them know that they can use any number is with that interval. And just as a reminder, even though that's parentheses and even though it has a comma, this is not an ordered pair. It's an interval. And this is just our fancy way of telling people, pick any number you want. But we can also use interval notation to just give a piece of the number line, or several pieces of the number line. But this right here does mean the same thing as all real numbers. OK. And what's kind of cool to know about domain is this. Many, many functions have domain negative infinity to infinity. There are tons of functions out there that can take any number you want to put in them. They're very common, these functions, that can handle any number. In fact, they are so common what we're going to do is we will almost assume our domain is negative infinity to infinity, all the numbers, unless we notice a reason that it is not. So when we approach a new function, we sort of go at that new function and say, maybe the domain is negative infinity to infinity. Maybe when someone asks me for the domain for that, all I have to do is write down this and I'll be done. But what I'm going to teach you is I'm going to teach you the things you should look for that will hint you to the fact that maybe the domain isn't this. So as of now, and We'll add some more later in the semester. But as of now, there are three major things that keep the domain from being negative infinity to infinity. In other words, when you're looking at a new function, if you don't see one of these three things I'm about to mention, you can pretty much assume the domain's going to be negative infinity to infinity. And when I say three things, just to make it clear what I'm saying up here, later in this class we'll see some other reasons the domain might not be negative infinity to infinity, but for right now, three reasons it's going to be fine. Three ways is going to be fine. 
All right. Here are the things we need to make look. We need to look for. Never divide by zero. In other words, be careful if there is a variable in the denominator. If you ever see an x hanging out in the denominator, then there might be a chance we'll divide by zero, and that's going to be a problem. Never take the square root or any even root of a negative. We gotta watch out for those square roots because we can't have a negative number under a square root when we're finding domain. And I say any even root because not only do square roots cause a problem, you know, like a square root, but also like a fourth root or a sixth root. We don't see those as often in this class, but they do come up. And if one of those comes up, we need to be aware that we can't have a negative number under those also. The other thing that might prevent domain from being negative infinity to infinity, because that's what these are, these are things that might keep us from letting our domain be negative infinity to infinity, is some equations represent a real world situation that restricts the domain. A quick way of saying that is if it's a story problem, it might not make sense to plug certain numbers in. So you walk into a room and there's a function sitting there. I don't know what kind of room you're walking into, but you walk into a room and there's a function sitting there. And the function is yelling at you, please tell me my domain. And you're thinking in your head, the domain's probably going to be negative infinity to infinity because that domain comes up a lot. But first, I better make sure that none of these things happen. Then I can decide. All right. So, this is a function, and you know it's a function because I'm using function notation. And the question someone wants to ask is, what's the domain of this function? And in our mind, the first thing we think when we hear what is the domain is we think maybe it's negative infinity to infinity. But then we see an x on the bottom, and we think that's probably not going to be the domain because I see an x in the denominator. That's the thought process we go through. And then you might think, does that mean I can't plug in zero, because I'm not allowed to divide by zero. And that's a pretty natural question to ask, to think, well, if there's an x on the bottom, I must not be able to plug in zero. But the thing is this, zero is not inherently the bad number to plug in. What's bad is if we plug in a number that makes us divide by zero. And if we plug a zero into this function, It's not a problem at all. But there is a problem if we plug what in? Two. A 2, because that will cause division by 0. Because if you plug a 2 in there, you're going to have 2 minus 2 on the bottom, and you'll end up dividing by 0. Everyone cool with that? So we need to not put a 2 in there. So what we think is we want to say, I want to do the whole number line
I want to do the entire number line, except I don't want to plug a 2 in there, because 2 is the only number that will cause me to divide by 0. So what I need, everyone, is I need an interval that represents everything less than 2. What symbol do we use to represent all the way down this direction on the number line? Negative, Negative infinity. And I go all the way up to 2. But can I actually plug a 2 into this equation? No. 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 So I put a parenthesis here. And what that means, just in case you forgot, I was talking about this super fast at the end of class last time, I think. The parenthesis means get as close to 2 as you want, but don't use Two. That's what that parenthesis means. It means you can get as close to it as you want. And why do I say as close to it as you want? Because you can plug in this number if you want. Because if you plug that in, you're not going to be dividing by zero. You can get as close to two as you want, but you can't plug in two. But then you can also plug in any number bigger than two that you want. So. We go from 2 to infinity. And I got all flustered at the end of class last time. I couldn't remember if this meant and or or. And I actually changed it in the notes. It does mean or. What we're doing, actually, everyone, this is one way of thinking about it, is we are basically saying you can plug in any number in there except for 2. And what this does right here with the parentheses and the 2 is we are actually kind of, and this is not something you'll see in a math book, but we are jumping over the number 2 because it is not OK and not in the domain. So we just jump over it and we say, any number below it, any number above it, don't use 2. Naturally, once you get good at these problems, they won't take all this time to do it. You don't need to write all this verbal explanation, but this is how we learn it, as we kind of see what's going on under the hood. Questions or comments about that? just recap this one real quick. All right. This is the square root function. We can only take the square root of 0 or positive numbers. So for this one, we look at the entire number line, and we say to people, I am more than happy to plug a 0 in there for you if you want, because the square root of 0 is 0. That's just fine. I am also happy to plug in any number bigger than 0. So this domain can be done all with one piece. And what this one looks like is it goes from 0 to infinity. We put a parenthesis on infinity because infinity always gets a parenthesis. And then we put a bracket on 0. And what the bracket means instead of the parenthesis is this means you can use this number. In other words, a better way of saying that is it is part of the domain. It was, uh, was not jumped. We can use 0. You are allowed to plug a 0 in here or anything bigger than 0. We don't do anything with this side because there's no negative numbers to plug into this thing. We can't plug any negatives in. So that is the domain, everyone. The domain is finished. This one was just one piece, and it was this one. Because we're not plugging negative numbers in. So if you're thinking, Steve, that seems a little bit fishy. It might seem a little bit fishy because with, sometimes with domain, we're jumping over a number. Sometimes we're starting at a number and just moving on from there. There are different things to remember. So the brackets mean that number is included, and the parentheses 
are for negative infinity, for infinity, or not including the number. And what do I mean when I say including or not including? When I include it, it's in the domain. You can plug it into the equation. When I don't include it, it's not in the domain, and therefore you cannot plug it into the equation. So when I'm saying included here, I mean in the domain. The reason we always use parentheses with negative infinity to infinity is because negative infinity to infinity aren't numbers. They're concepts. You can, get, you can keep going towards them, but you never actually get there. So you will never see this. That's bogus. That's like saying you can go all the way up to infinity and stop at infinity. Doesn't make any sense. So never use that. All right, so what are our red flags, I said? Our, our big red flags are don't divide by 0. Don't take the square root of a negative and check this one out here. If there's one thing every algebra student loves, it's story problems. Let f of x represent your pay for working x hours in a week. Now this is not that complicated of an equation, but all equations are annoying if you don't know what they mean. I put a 15.5 in here and multiply it by x. What I'm trying to tell you is we put in the number of hours you work, and I multiply it by 15.5. In other words, this represents someone who's making $15.50 per hour. Now this is a story problem. There is no division here. There is no square root here. So someone might be tempted to say the domain is negative infinity to infinity. But that's not right. How many people in here worked negative eight hours last week? Now there's no reason you can't mathematically multiply 15.5 times negative eight, but negative eight doesn't make any sense in the, text of the, in the context of this problem. The story problem dictates that the domain cannot go any lower than zero. And it might not be desirable, but is it possible to work zero hours in a week? Can that happen? So zero makes sense. Can we go up to infinity now? No. Probably most jobs, you'd want to stop this at 40. But no matter where you work, you can't go above 168. Now, it did occur to me that if it was daylight savings time and we were turning back the clocks, you actually could work 169 hours that week. But we're not going to mess with that right now. We're just trying to show that even though 15.5x doesn't seem like it could have any problems with any numbers at all, because it's a story problem, the domain is determined for us. Questions, comments, concerns? Great. Remember, if you do have a question and I didn't turn off the recorder, you can always, and I'll turn it off for you before you ask. Am I writing a function right now? Yes. How do you know? I'm not done yet. Function notation. Oh, I used function notation, didn't I? Yes, I have to write a function now. You see this up here. I guess I'll make that more clear, zero. And you start wondering about domain. And you think to yourself, any division there in that? You see any x's in denominators? No. No? Any square root? I know there's a squared up here, but that's not the same thing. That's a squared, not a square root. Does anyone see a square root anywhere? No. No? No square root? Okay. Did I mention anything about this being some sort of story problem that model models some real world situation? No. Does anyone know what the graph looks like? 
Does anyone know what the domain is? No. Well, if we send out all three of these things, what's the domain going to be? Negative infinity. Isn't that cool, everyone? If you know what to look for for the domain not to be negative infinity to infinity, once you've eliminated all those possibilities, you can pretty much say domain is negative infinity to infinity. Are those three rules the only three rules you'll ever have to worry about? No. But they're the only three rules we have to worry about till later, and then we'll learn more rules as we go. That's the point. Yep, we're done. It's a very complicated looking function. I don't feel like drawing the graph. I don't think I really could draw that off the top of my head. And, but I do know that I could plug any number in there I want. All right, let's try this one. Now, this does have division in it. There's a division in there by 17. But 17 is 17. 17 will be 17 yesterday, 17 tomorrow. It's just going to keep on being 17. Will 17 ever mystically turn into 0? No. No, it's a 17. So there is division, but not with a variable. So no matter what I put in there for x, there's still just going to be a 17 on the bottom, so I don't need to worry about dividing by 0. And there's clearly no square roots. This is not a story problem. So our domain is any number you want from the number line, negative infinity to infinity, interval notation. That's pretty slick. Kind of a nasty looking function. goes off. Because we have an x in the denominator. And if there's an x in the denominator, it's possible that we could plug in a number that would make us accidentally divide by 0. So thinking quickly, I write the domain and make sure that I never plug a 0 in there. And then I walk away thinking about how I'm the best at math, and there's no one better, and I've never made a mistake before. But have I made a mistake? Yeah, zero is not evil. There's nothing wrong with zero. The problem is if you plug a number in here that makes you divide by zero. So, really, we want to tell everyone you better not plug what in there? Negative 10. Negative 10. So, just like before, when we did a jump, over 0 to kick it out. We jumped 0 because we didn't want to put that in there. Over here, we're going to jump negative 10. And kick that number out. I can jump any number I want. I just jumped over negative 10. And what am I telling people? I'm saying you can plug any number you want in here as long as it's less than negative 10 or bigger than negative 10, but don't plug negative 10 in there. It's against the rules. Questions, comments, concerns? Huh. All right, here's a good math problem, everyone. I would like you to multiply some numbers for me, and I'd like you to do it without a calculator. Zero. What's that? Zero. Stop being so fast. How did you get zero? Because there's a zero in the multiplication. Because there's a zero in the multiplication. It doesn't even matter what the other pieces are, because there's a zero right there, so this whole thing equals zero. If you're multiplying a bunch of factors together, and one of those factors is a zero, then the whole thing collapses and goes to zero. So, we use this idea if we need to jump several numbers.
You see, this particular denominator on this function has several different factors in it. And we know from this multiplication problem up here, if any one of those factors is zero, it will turn the entire denominator into zero. Does everyone agree with that? The whole thing will go to zero. So therefore, no matter what happens, I better not plug in a three, because that will make this first factor zero, and I don't care what these two are, the whole thing will go to zero. Agreed? Yes. What else can I plug in? Negative two. Can't plug in that negative two. And what else can I plug in? Positive five. Positive five. Think about this before you answer out loud. Can I plug a negative seven into this thing? Yes. I hear a yes. I see some noddings. And I see some people that aren't quite sure. Negative seven is fine because we are allowed to have zero on top. That doesn't cause a problem at all. So you don't need to worry about that one up there. Just the ones on the bottom. We can jump as many numbers as we want, but we must do it from smallest to largest. The interval, so when we write the interval notation for a domain, it needs to be in the right order. And the order is not, no big secret, it's dictated by the number line. Because I am not allowed to plug in a negative 2. I am not allowed to plug in a 3, and I'm not allowed to plug in a 5 but I'm allowed to plug in anything smaller than negative two. I'm allowed to plug in anything between negative two and three, anything between three and five, and anything bigger than five. I just need to make sure I jump over those three numbers, but I need to jump them in the right order, from smallest to largest. So I write an interval for each one of these pieces of the, of the domain. The first one goes from negative infinity to negative 2. Do I want anyone to plug a negative 2 into this equation? No. no. That's why I use a parenthesis. Because I don't want anyone to plug a negative 2 in. But you can plug in anything between negative 2 and 3. Just don't use negative 2 or 3. You can plug anything in between 3 and 5. Just don't use 3 or 5. And you can plug in anything bigger than 5. And that's the domain. Kind of long. But what I'm doing is just like I jumped over 0 in one problem, just like I jumped over negative 10 in a previous problem, this time I'm jumping over three numbers. But I must do it from smallest to largest. And the parentheses, remember, are there because I don't want people using those numbers. I am purposely skipping those numbers. If you put the brackets on these, it's wrong. Because if you put the brackets on those, you're telling people to go ahead and use those numbers. And these are the numbers we said people cannot use. All right, check this out. <laughs> I just plugged a negative number into a square root. How is that even possible? How could I have done that? I didn't. The answer will be a positive. So, I can't take the square root of a negative. But if there's something in the function that turns that negative into a positive before I actually take the square root, is that OK? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's what's going on here. You see, this piece right here, bonus points, if you no real bonus points, but just like, you know, fun bonus points. Anyone remember what the expression underneath this is called? 
It's called the radicand. There you go, that's fun. It's called the radicand. What we need is we need the radicand to not be negative. But it's okay to plug certain negative numbers in there if it's going to become positive before we take the square root. So probably the best thing I could say is whatever's underneath here, whatever that is, that better be greater than or equal to zero. If I'm going to take the square root of it, it better be greater than or equal to zero. And look at this. Subtract 10 from both sides. And it turns out I can plug numbers in there if they're greater than or equal to negative 10. Because that plus 10 will take care of any of those being negative after we add the 10. So, if I think of the number line for this, the number line for this will look like this here. Here's 0, here's negative 10. So I want to tell people they can plug in negative 10 or anything bigger than negative 10. Shoot, am I supposed to use a parenthesis or a bracket for that? Bracket. A bracket. Is it okay to plug negative 10 in here? Yes. And I want everyone to know that, and I let people know that with a bracket. Right on. Die. Good. We got our domain. What I sometimes tell people, and this would never make it in a math book either, but I sometimes tell people, if you ever have f of x equals the square root of some mess, the secret is to take the mess and set it greater than or equal to 0. Then you solve for x and turn into an interval, and you win. So if someone gives you this, a square root of something, and they want to know what's the domain, You take whatever's underneath there, whatever the radicand is, you set it greater than or equal to zero, solve for x, and you win, just like we did here. All right. How about this one here? Um, h of x. How's that look? Does that look okay? No. no? I, I'm the math teacher, so take another look. That looks okay, right? Yes. No. no. Oh, shoot. That's odd. You know what? If the index is odd, you can have negatives. I remember that now. Shoot, I remember. I'll be right back to this page, but I remember that back here somewhere. Where was it? Where were those red flags? Never take the square root or any even root of a negative. This one's a cube root, everyone. It's odd. So it doesn't follow the same rules and it's okay to have a negative underneath there. Don't let that fool you. Everyone see that all right? You gotta be careful, because we get so used to doing square roots, we forget that the cube root can, uh, can handle the negatives. All right, that's good to know. But what about this? And here, here's the big one. Here's a problem. No, I just used H. Use a different letter here. F. I want to do this problem with all of you because 
This is a function, absolutely, because I'm using f of x, I'm using function notation. But this has two of our red flags in it. It has both a square root and it has an x in the denominator. So we have to make sure we don't divide by zero. Everyone cool so far? Yes. Let's talk to our numerator and denominator separately. If we talk to just the numerator, it says I have a square root of x minus 4. And then it says that means that you better make sure that x minus 4 is greater than or equal to 0. You better make sure that whatever I'm about to take the square root of is not negative. I add 4 to both sides. I get x must be greater than or equal to 4. I think of my number line. And this makes the top happy. The top will be happy as long as you plug in 4 or a number bigger than 4. That's what, that's what the numerator is asking for because that's square root. Then we talk to the denominator. And it's not just x minus 10, it's x minus 10 on the bottom. And since it's on the bottom, what number better we never plug in there? Positive 10. Positive 10. So the bottom saying, please don't use 10. So we got the top saying, we have the top saying, I'm fine with 4, and I'm fine with everything bigger than 4. And we've got the bottom saying, I'm fine with anything you want to plug in there, except for 10. And the way we make both of them happy is we say I'm going to plug in 4, anything bigger than 4, except for 10. Then everyone will be happy. You can plug in 4, you can plug in anything bigger than 4, except for the number 10. So our domain is actually going to look something like this. Well, not something like this, exactly like this. Do you think it's possible to write that in interval notation? Yes. Parenthesis or bracket on 10? Parenthesis. 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 Can't use 10. Jumping 10. Four is cool, so it gets a bracket. 10 is not, so it doesn't. We jump it. And we just found the domain of a pretty complicated function because it had both a square root and a possible division by zero. We took care of both things. So let me just make one quick announcement before we take our break. With equations, we don't always talk about range because it can be much harder to figure out, to figure what can come out as a y value. Until we've got a deeper understanding of functions, for a lot of functions it's not easy to figure out what the range is. So with a lot of equations, when they give you an equation, don't be concerned if they just start asking you about domain and not the range. We talked about domain and range last time when we looked at a bunch of ordered pairs. But when we talk about equations, we usually focus on the domain and then maybe the range later. But after the break, we will do domain 
and range of graphs. So let's talk about domain and range with graphs. So when you're doing the domain of a graph, you always look left to right, and you only look at the x values. When you're doing range with a graph, you look bottom to top, and you look at the y values only. So you got to train your brain to switch. With domain, you're looking at x. Range, you're looking at y. Domain, you're going left to right. Range, you're going bottom to top. And we're going to keep using interval notation. And here's how we use it on a graph. If a graph has a solid point on it, we're going to use brackets to say we actually get to that point. graph has a hollow point on it, then we're going to use parentheses there to show that we actually don't get there, we just get really, really close to it. And many graphs have arrows on the ends to show they just keep going forever and ever in some direction. And then we're going to use negative infinity or infinity, and that's going to be usually, and I'm not even sure if we're going to see an example where that doesn't come up, but that can happen where it's not really going up forever or down forever. It's just kind of going straight out to the side forever. But we won't worry about that now. Usually when you see an arrow, negative infinity or infinity is going to be in play. And of course, with negative infinity or infinity, we always use parentheses. That hasn't changed. So this makes a lot more sense once we get some practicing. So we're going to practice these. And I have prepared some graphs ahead of time. So I'm going to put them up here. So once again, please remember, you don't need to copy down the graphs. You can use my graphs up here to write your answers down if you want to play along, and that would be great. And then later, you can print off the graphs. But don't feverishly try to be copying down these graphs and then like miss what we're talking about. So let me see how slick I can be with this. Oh, copy. Maybe this isn't going to work. That's not what I want to do. Let's try this instead. Documents. <laughs> Somehow that's haunting me again. All right. I was all proud of myself for using technology. Documents. Here we go. F1. Copy. Edit. Paste. Yep, we have a winner. Okay, cool. Here it is. All right. Pretty simple looking graph. Does it pass the vertical line test? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a function. So I can go ahead and call this a function. I'll just go ahead and call it f of x. And just to help us out here, I'm going to label these ordered pairs. This looks like negative 6, negative 3. And this one over here looks like 7, 2. Now, to give the domain of this graph, remember what we do. We think left to right. And we only think about the x values. You're not even looking at those y values right now, I hope. You're just looking at the x values. So if you look at this graph, what is the furthest x value we see on the graph to the left? Negative 7. Negative 6 is the furthest one we see to the left. Everyone cool with that? Yeah. Does the graph actually get to negative 6? Yes. yes, it has a solid point, and solid point means we use a bracket on negative 6. What is the furthest left x value we get to? 7. 7, right there. And we get there because there's a solid point, so we put a bracket. That's our domain. Brackets because of the solid points. Negative 6 to 7 because we go left to right. Why negative 6 and 7, not negative 3 and 2? Because these are x values for the domain. Everyone okay with that so far? Let's do the range. we got to switch gears because now suddenly we're going bottom to top, and now we're looking at y values. 
So, everyone, the flood waters are rising. Dun, 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 dun. What is the lowest y value we get to? Negative three. Negative three. Solid point, bracket. Everyone, the ceiling is collapsing. What is the highest y value? Two. Two. Y value. And that's the domain range of a graph. Yeah? If there was a point in between, would you go bottom up and top down still? All right, let's look at another one of these. Faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's another graph. I'm going to label a few ordered pairs on this one. So we got negative 7, 3 up here at the top. We've got negative 2, 9. This one looks important. And we're going to call that one 4, 0. And then we have an arrow down here to show the graph keeps going forever and ever and ever. And that arrow indicates a couple things to me. What it actually shows me is that this graph goes down and right forever. And the down is going to impact our y values, our range. And the right is going to impact our x values, our domain. OK, everyone, so let's do our domain. So looking at that graph, what is the farthest left x value everyone sees? Negative 7. Negative 7. Everyone with me over here? Negative 7. Solid point or hollow? Solid. Solid. Negative 7. Is there a furthest right x value? No. no. This graph goes right forever and ever and ever and ever. What mathematical symbol do we indicate? Do we use to indicate we're going to the right forever? <laughs> infinity. infinity. And certainly we reach infinity, so I'll use a bracket. Never use a bracket with infinity. Parenthesis. Because we have an arrow that shows we keep on going forever and ever and ever. And that's our domain. This thing has every x value in it between negative 7 all the way up forever, including negative 7. Now here's what's interesting about the range for this one. When we did that first example, we found the domain using the two points on the end, and we found the range using the two points on the end. But this one doesn't necessarily work like that. Let's start with the floodwaters rising. I don't have to rise them very far because the graph goes down forever. Does everyone see that? And if the graph goes down forever, where do you think we start our range? Negative infinity. Because the graph went down forever. But it's not this end point that gives the highest point on the graph. The highest point on the graph is right here at negative 2, 9. At the moment, I don't care about the negative 2. I do care about the 9. So I put the 9 here. Now, someone might say to me, Steve, I was watching you very, very carefully. And what I noticed was, when you were doing this problem, you put that solid point there. It wasn't there before. So how do I know if I should use a parenthesis or a bracket if there's not a solid point there? Well, here's the deal, everyone. It is the grapher's job, the person drawing the graph. The person drawing the graph must put in a hollow point if they want it. Otherwise, it is solid. So because whoever drew this graph, and it was me, whoever drew this graph did not specifically put a hollow point up there, you can assume the graph gets that high and that that's a solid point at the top of that. So yes, indeed, we do get there. And that means, yes, indeed, we do put a bracket on 9. What's, what's tricky about the domain and range of a graph is because 
we're working with functions mostly in this class, you're going to find your domain just by looking at the farthest left point and, and, and the farthest right point. But when you find the range, they're not necessarily going to be the end points of the graph. You've got to come sometimes go in the middle to find the highest or lowest point. And that causes people some grief. So just be careful of that. Because a lot of people might look at this and they might just see like this piece right here and they might say, oh, that's a low point on the graph. So I guess the low point is three. And they forget they're supposed to be looking over here at the arrow. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Um, I guess I'm up to graph number three now. Copy, paste. Well, this one looks kind of grim. Is this a function, everyone? Does it pass the vertical line test? Yes. Yeah, it sure does. This is still a function. I'll just give it a name, h of x. What's going to happen with this one, though, is we can all see, even if we don't like math very much, we can all see that this graph has two pieces to it. And we can all see, just by looking at it a little bit, that there is a big gap in here. And that means that our domain will be two intervals. One interval to give this piece over here on the left, and another interval to give this piece over here on the right. Let's label a few things. So this ordered pair right here is at negative 4, 6. This hollow point, I'll still label where the hollow point is, that's at 1, 6. And then we have something here at 6, 6, it looks like. And we have something here at 9, 1. All right, well, let's, let's not make this too hard on ourselves. Let's just start over here with this thing. Now, this piece right here, we can see that this goes up and left forever. And when I say up, everyone, I'm not talking about increasing and decreasing right now. I know when I said decreasing, we always move left to right. But what I'm talking about is which way the arrow is physically pointing right now. The arrow is physically pointing up and to the left. So our domain, is everyone okay if I say the domain is going to start way back at negative infinity because this thing goes left forever. And then it keeps on going until we get to what x value? Negative four. Negative four. And there it stops. And then it starts up again. So there's another piece to the domain. And this is kind of a trick question the way I'm asking it. But as far as writing our interval over here, not worrying about parentheses or brackets again, but as far as just writing our interval, what number are we going to start our domain back up at again? Remember to look at the x values. I know it's a hollow point, but what's the x value that goes to that hollow point? One. one. So we write a 1 here, everyone. We do write a 1. But because that's a hollow point right there where we're starting, we use a parenthesis. And what that's basically saying, everyone, is that's just a fancy way of saying we start just past 1. Now, we don't start at 2, because 2 is quite a bit past 1. And that would leave out all the numbers that are like decimally close to 1. So that's why we use the parenthesis there. And then we continue moving to the right until we get to what number? 9. 9. The x value, 9. Everyone hip to that? Between 1 and 9, but 9 gets a bracket, because we actually get to this 9, this x value. And we didn't actually get to this x value of 1. And I'm not even looking at the y values right now, everyone. I'm just looking at the x values. So if you're thinking to yourself, what about this 6 here and this 6 here and this 6? No, not even looking at those. I'm, looking at, I'm just looking at the x values. Now when I do the range, I'm going to look at the y values. The waters are rising, everyone. The waters are rising. Have I hit the function yet? No. When am I going to first hit that function at what y value? One. one, right here. That one right there. Is that a solid point there or a hollow point? So the lowest point this graph ever reaches on the y-axis is one. 
And I use a bracket because of that solid point. All right, now here's a good reason to come to class, because if you try to figure this out later and you didn't come to class, this would be weird. But pretend you're over here and you have your laser cannon. And with your laser cannon, you're going to shoot beams straight out. And you're never going to go lower than one because that's where our range begins. Now my question is this. As you work your way up here shooting your laser cannon, is there anywhere above one that you can actually shoot a beam through and miss the function? This is weird, everyone. The function clearly has a gap in it. But that only makes us have a gap in our domain, not in our range. Because even if you shoot your laser beam right here, even though you're not going to hit that hollow point right there, you're going to hit this solid point here, and you're going to hit all these other solid points along this part right here. Right along here. And here. So there is not a gap in the range, even though there is a gap in the graph. So really, if we can never find another gap as we move our way up, where's the range going to stop? Or where is it not going to stop, I should say? Infinity. Infinity. Isn't that wild? That even though there's a hole in the graph, there's not a hole in the range. It makes sense because the line goes Yeah, it's solid if you go, like if, you, if you're this person over here with the laser cannon. Good luck with that. All right. Questions or comments about that one? Let me, uh... uh the question we just heard when the video was paused was, what if we took this piece of the graph right here and we moved it up one spot so the point started right here and it went up from there like that. Then yes, there would be a gap in the range right in here and we would have to write the range using two different intervals. All right. All right, here we have another function. It does pass the vertical line test so we can call this a function. And it looks like we have a hollow point, and it is hollow, up here at negative 2, 8. And we have a solid point right here at 0, negative 5. So it looks like our domain is going to have a gap in it. There is a gap in the domain. So domain, first piece over here. How far to the left does this first piece go? Negative infinity, all the way up to very close to, but doesn't quite reach, negative, negative, two. negative 2. And the way we indicate to everyone that it doesn't quite reach negative 2 is with a parenthesis. Then, where does the graph start again as we're going from left to right? At what x value? Zero. zero. Does it actually start at 0? Yeah. Yes. yeah, the solid point tells us that. And on to infinity. Infinity always gets parentheses. The reason I did this example, because it doesn't seem as bad as the one we just did, but the reason I did this one is because the range is not an interval. It is just a list of two numbers. The range in this thing is not like from negative infinity to like negative 12 or something like that. It's just two single numbers because every ordered pair, every single ordered pair on this graph is either on this piece up here or this piece down here. And every single ordered pair on this piece up here ends with a value of 8. And every single ordered pair on this piece down here ends with a value of negative 5. So the only two y values we're ever going to see anywhere on this function are 8 and negative 5. So I don't use parentheses. I don't use brackets because those are for intervals. I use my braces. Why am I doing that? Because I'm not writing an interval. I'm just going to write a list of two numbers. And since it's a list, the order actually doesn't make a difference. You could have written 8, negative 5 also. Because it's just a list of numbers. Well, parentheses and brackets are for intervals, and 
braces are for a list. Braces are for a list of numbers. Parentheses and brackets are for intervals, and parentheses are also used for ordered pairs. It's actually kind of the job of the mathematician or the person doing the problem to let people know if they're talking about intervals or ordered pairs. Um, for instance, I'm going to pause it. So now, we talk about increasing and decreasing, which are two words I kind of alluded at earlier, uphill and downhill. And constant, which is flat ground. We're now not going to just talk about what the domain range of a graph is. We're going to talk about what the shape is of the graph a little bit more. Whether the graph is going uphill, downhill, or it's flat ground. In order to do this, we need a function. We can actually have done domain and range on the graph without a function, but to do increasing, decreasing, and constant, we need a function for this. We need something that passes the vertical line test. Otherwise, this doesn't make any sense. The other thing we need to remember with this is we always move left to right when you're doing this. Always. You see, I'm not talking about domain and range right now. I'm talking about if I was a little person here running along this graph, am I going uphill or downhill? And I always move left to right. And people get messed up by that because they see this arrow. And what direction is that arrow basically pointing, everyone? Up. So they think, aren't you going up right there? No. Because I'm not talking about the way the arrow's pointing. I'm talking about what I'm doing right here. Look, everyone, as my long green hair flows in the breeze. As I make my way across this graph, right here I'm moving downhill, right here I'm moving uphill, because I always move left to right. So, if the picture looks like this, and remember, don't really worry about which way those arrows are pointing. What am I doing right there? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing, because I am going uphill because I'm going from left to right. Then what do I do for a little while? After I get here, what do I do then? Decrease. I decrease. And then what am I doing? Constant, because I'm on flat ground. See, whenever you look at a graph, you don't need to worry about it. You're going up or down because you just say, I'm always moving left to right. And that's how I know if I'm going up or down. And because this is a function, you will always be able to figure that out. If it wasn't a function, it would be trickier. Like if I put a circle up here, you really couldn't tell if you were moving up or down on a circle. All right. So how do we describe increasing, decreasing, and constant on a graph? Number one, we're going to keep using interval notation. We are going to keep using interval notation to describe increasing, decreasing, and constant. Number two, x values only. No y values. What we're going to describe is what is happening between two x values, or it's occasionally negative infinity or infinity. So we're not going to use y values for this. Kind of like domain, we didn't even look at the y, we didn't look at the y values. We're not going to look at y values for increasing, decreasing, and constant either. Three. Only use parentheses. Never brackets, even at solid points. We're talking about what's happening in between two values. So we're not going to use brackets for this, even if you see a solid point. We're still going to use brackets for domain and range when it's appropriate. But for increasing and decreasing and constant, which is what I'm talking about right now, parentheses only, no brackets. I don't care if the point's solid or not. 
Um, do, 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 do. I'll write this again because it's so important. Left to right always and five. Multiple intervals, in case there's like two hills our little stick figure runs up, multiple intervals joined by a comma, not the union sign. And I know that's a lot of rules, everyone, but math has a lot of rules. We need to make sure we're all using the same notation. So when we write a bunch of intervals for like maybe if there's several hills our little stick figure runs up instead of just one, we don't join those with a union sign like we would with domain or range. We do join them with a comma though. I will practice this, of course. I'm not just going to leave you here with this and say good luck. We'll practice this. Let's see how this works. And I'll remind you of all those rules as we go. And of course, I'll post this after class. All right. Let me get my graph here. Uh, graph number six is what I want. Copy. All right, well, this looks like a, a good picture to do some running. By the way, which direction does our little stick figure always run? Left to right. Okay, now I'm going to label these ordered pairs. But as I'm labeling them, I want you to think to yourself, Steve doesn't really need to be writing down those y values because we're not going to use them. So really, you should just be looking at the x values of these ordered pairs. And the reason for that is, when we use interval notation to describe increase and decrease in constant, we're not actually trying to tell people how high the mountain is or how low the valley is. We're not going to tell people how high we go or how low we go. We're just going to let them know between what x values are we going uphill, between which x values are we going downhill, and between which x values are we on constant flat ground. So when you see this up here, you might think to yourself, Look how high he goes. I don't care how high this stick figure goes. I just care between which two x values is it running up that hill right there. So when I say increasing, and I'm going to give an interval where this guy is increasing, what's the first interval I'm going to write between what two x values? Negative 8 and negative 6. Those are the two x values between which he's going uphill. And we only, I'm not hollow points only, that's not what I mean. I mean parentheses only for increasing, decreasing, and constant. So between negative 8 and negative 6, we are going uphill. Is there ever another time that our little stick figure is going to go uphill? Yes. yes. Yeah. Between this x value and this x value. And once again, you might be thinking, do I need to say how low he is here? No, I don't care how low he is. Do I need to say how high he is here? No, you don't. I just care between which two x values are we going uphill. And what are they? Negative 9 and 5. Careful. Between which x values are we going uphill? 7 and 10. X values only. X values. Don't even want the Y's right now. So between the X values negative 8 and negative 6, we're going uphill. And between the X values 7 and 10, we're going uphill. Are we ever going downhill? Yes. yes. Between which two x values are we going downhill? Three and seven. Between which two x values are we on flat ground? Is the function constant? Between which two x values? Negative six and three. Why parentheses? Because we always use parentheses for increasing, decreasing, and constant. When do we use brackets? When we're doing domain and range. 
So just remember, I don't care how high you go. I don't care how low you go. I just care between what two x values are you doing it. While we're here, let's see if we can switch our gears and our brain for a moment and see if we can jot down the domain and range. And for domain and range, is it possible we're going to be using brackets again? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. So now, still working with x values only, because we're doing domain, we look at the furthest left point, the furthest right point, and we give those two x values. What's the furthest left x value? Negative 8. Negative 8. What's the furthest right x value? Negative. 10. And I get to use brackets because there are solid points at those places. And I'm doing domain now, not increasing or decreasing or constant. The waters are rising. What is the lowest y value? Negative 9. Negative nine. Solid or hollow? Solid. Solid. The ceiling is collapsing. What's the highest y value? Five. Five. Solid. Brackets. We can do this. We just need to make sure we keep focused on what are we doing? Are we doing increasing, decreasing, and constant? Or are we doing domain and range? If you're thinking to yourself, it seems like you spend a lot more time looking at x values than y values, you do. Because all of these, increasing, decreasing, and constant are x values, the domain is x values, and the only one that's a y value is the range. I'd like to do another one of these problems with you, if that's OK. All right, let me import another graph. Looks like we're on graph 7 now. Copy. Edit. Paste. All right. Now, let's see here. Increasing, decreasing, constant. If I'm a little stick figure running along this, uh, this function here, which way am I running? Left to right. Always left to right. That being said, if I'm always running left to right on this thing, am I ever going uphill? No. No. And that happens. There's no uphill on this graph. Is there a place where I'm decreasing? Yes. Yeah, I am decreasing. But remember, this arrow means that this keeps going forever and ever and ever in this direction. So I'm coming downhill, and what's the farthest left I ever am? Negative infinity. Now, that seems kind of weird to some people because they're like, wait a minute. If you're decreasing, how can you start at negative infinity? This is not telling me that I'm down at negative infinity. This is telling me I'm negative infinity to the left. That's what that's telling me. That's why I can start with negative infinity. And I keep going downhill until I get to this point right here. But I don't care about the whole point. I only care about the x value. What's that x value? Negative 4. And do I use a parenthesis or a bracket? Parenthesis, because we're doing increasing, decreasing, and constant. So I start way, way back here further than anyone can imagine. And I'm running downhill, 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 downhill all the way to negative 4. And then once I get to negative 4, I'm on flat ground. And how long am I on flat ground till? Forever, all the way up to infinity, but no bracket. Because we never use brackets on infinity, whether we're talking about domain range, increasing, decreasing, or constant. How far to the left does this graph go? All the way. How far to the right does this graph go? Positive infinity, all the way. How low does this graph go? Five, that's the lowest y value on the graph you'll ever reach. There's tons of places where you're at that five, but that's the lowest we ever go, it's five. But how high does it go? Infinity, because this arrow's going up and to the left. Yeah, question. Uh, do you always have intervals always smallest to largest. So if your interval includes negative infinity, that's going to be the first thing you ever write, because that's as low. And infinity will be the last thing you write if you ever write it. 
cool. Anyone else? All right, a couple more things I want to talk about today. Um, I want to talk about this idea that you're going to see maybe come up in a couple homework problems, and that is where is the graph continuous? And the reason I want to talk about that is because this is a lot like domain, but allows you to express where the graph breaks. And as I said, you're going to see this in a couple homework problems, so I do want to talk to you about it. Where is the graph continuous? Because if I make a graph that looks like this, First of all, do we agree that that's a function because I used a hollow point? We talked about graphs like that last time. This is a function. That hollow point makes it so we do pass the vertical line test right here at 2. But this graph right here has a domain of negative infinity to infinity. And if someone just told you the domain of the graph is negative infinity to infinity, you might just think it's all one piece that goes left forever and right forever. If someone asks you where the graph is continuous, this is when you get a chance to say, well, there's one piece that goes from negative infinity to 2, and then there's another piece that goes from 2 to infinity. And you might be thinking I made a mistake, but use parentheses only for continuous, even if there's a solid point. And this is what allows you to say that if you're on this piece, that piece kind of goes from negative infinity to 2. That's where it's like one solid piece. And this one goes from 2 to infinity. But we do use parentheses for this. This is actually a big deal in, the, in a calculus class. If you ever take Calc 1, which I hope a lot of you do plan on going on to take that, you talk a lot about continuity in there, or if a function's continuous or not. The reason it's sometimes people get it confused with domain is because a graph like this, the domain is negative infinity to infinity, and it's also continuous from negative infinity to infinity because it's all one piece. And sometimes people think continuous, where a graph is continuous is the same thing as domain, but the domain just tells you what x values you're allowed to plug in. When you start talking about if a graph is continuous, you're talking about how many individual pieces does it have. And that's not a huge deal in this class. You might see one or two homework problems on that. I just wanted you to be ready for it when you saw it, and I didn't want you to think it was the same thing as domain. You're actually kind of talking about the pieces that make up the graph. And there could be more than one. So don't freak out when you're doing your homework and some problem just suddenly says, hey, where is this graph continuous? It's talking about, tell me about kind of the domain of each individual piece. Question. So does it only go continuous? This is more sort of a uh, reminder for some of you. Plugging values and expressions into functions for x. Some of you might already know how to do exactly what I'm doing. You might be pros at this, but some of you might be a little rusty at it. That's why I want to talk about it. One thing we have to do a lot now that we use this function notation is quite often we are made to plug a number into a function. And some of you, I'd be willing to wager, are so sharp at this that you can do it in your head, and that's great. But others of us need to do it on the board or do it on paper and show all of our work, and that's good too. You see, when you plug a negative number in for an x, what I'm about to do is I'm about to plug a negative 4 in wherever I see an x, and there's two places. But if I write this, everyone, how does that look? Does that look great to you? No, because I'm supposed to be multiplying with those, aren't I? Not subtract. That's a mess. So what I should really do is whenever I plug in a number, 
for a variable, I should put it in a set of parentheses. And that looks a lot better now. Now I'm not going to mess it up. Because now I can do negative 4 squared. And since negative 4 times negative 4 got two negatives, we get a positive. And I can do negative 3 times 16 is negative 48. 5 times negative 4 minus 20 minus 2 equals minus 70. And I'm done. Because I was willing to take a little bit of time to make sure I did my work carefully. Those negatives can mess people up. Because even with a simple function, well, simpler than the one we just did, like this one, if someone tells you to plug a negative 11 in there, many other people that write this. And negative 11 squared like that actually means this. And that's not what we want. We don't want that. What we actually want to do is we want, when we plug that negative 11 in there, is we want to square the negative 11. Like that. You've got to be very, very careful when you're plugging numbers into functions. And you've got to be careful when you plug anything into a function because sometimes they ask you to plug something more complicated into a function than just a number. Look at this right here, everyone. This is a bit of a disaster. You see, when they put something inside those parentheses, when they replace that x with something else, whether it's a number or it's an expression like this, they expect you to do the same thing. And that is, put that wherever you see an x. And if you don't respect that idea I just told you of using parentheses, you're going to get in big trouble real fast. But if you use the parentheses when you replace this x and this x right here, it actually looks pretty smooth. But then, then you see some of the worst instructions you can ever see in a math class. You're like, what do you want from me? <laughs> simplify? What do you mean simplify? Well, on this type of problem, here's what they mean by simplify. They mean they want you to clear the parentheses. They mean they want you to collect like terms and write in descending order. The descending order, everyone, is just a fancy way of saying the powers on your variables are supposed to go from largest to smallest as you go left to right. Simplify is one of my least favorite terms in math because it seems that every different math textbook has its own definition of what they mean by simplify. And I do agree that some things are more complicated and we should simplify them, but I also think that people should make it clear what they mean by simplify. And this is what they mean by simplify. They mean clear those parentheses. They mean take that a plus 1 squared and FOIL it. They don't mean distribute the square. You cannot do that. Never. You know what? I can't. No, I'm done. I can't do any more tonight because I just thought about someone doing that and it made me angry. Everyone, we're done for the day. Actually, it's also time. I'm not just angry. Um,